Today, uh, I want to take us one step further into this little series that we've been calling The Invitation. I want to take us to Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 40. Uh, this is going to be our text for today. You love your Bible? Yeah. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 40 says this, and this is a piece of scripture that uh, not very many of us take time to read. If I'm honest with you, I haven't read it in a really long time, and I just want to share some things today that jumped out at me. As I was studying this week, uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of times, this was so beautiful about the Bible, is that how many of you know you can read scripture and then come back to it years later and something that you didn't see before is all of a sudden there and God's speaking to you through it. That's just the beautiful revelation of scripture. And it says this, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. What a promise. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Ever shout customary? Customary. Ever shout customary? Customary. I want you to shout one more word, baby, better than customary. Ever shout normal? Normal. Hold on to that for a second. To perform for him what was customary under the law, Simon took him up in his arm and praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Can we just stop there for a second? How many of you moms would start slashing at somebody if somebody just randomly grabbed your baby (laughs) when you showed up to church? Can we just look at the abnormal nature of this piece of scripture? Some dude named Simon rolls up on you, grabs your kid, lifts him up in the air, kind of like a Lion King moment, and starts saying this prayer, this praise, whatever these words are to him. It's a weird moment. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him, though. Then Simon blessed them and told his mother Mary. Now, this is where it gets even stranger. Not only did a random stranger grab the baby Jesus from his parents' hands. Then he turns to Mary and says this, indeed this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. How many of you are like, no thank you, back up buddy. (laughs) Merry Christmas. There was also a prophetess, Anna, and a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And she was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven, seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple. She did not leave the temple serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and speak to him about all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. Verse 40. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. This is one of the weirdest pieces of scripture. The story is strange, the circumstance is strange, and even more so, what we need to take notice of is that this is the moment following the event and grandeur of Jesus' birth. Jesus is no longer in the manger. They were doing what was customary or what was normal. It was average. It was ordinary. And so, as we continue on in our series, The Invitation, I want to speak to you from this subject today. If you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write this at the top of your notes. I want to speak to you from this subject, an ordinary liturgy. An ordinary liturgy as we look at an invitation to experience sacred moments in ordinary life. If you need another title for it today, I have a secondary title because it's just more fun. It's this, Jesus for Normal People. Will you pray with me just one more time this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's alive, it's active, it's powerful, has the ability to transform us from the inside out. God, I pray that you'd speak to us today in this first service of the day. God, I pray that your word would come alive to us. I thank you for what it is that you're doing in this place. We love you. We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory today. God, I pray that your word would change who we are from the inside out. We give you this space. Have your way. In Jesus' name. Mighty name. Come on, and everybody shouted. Amen. Come on, everybody shouted. Amen. Amen. Liturgy. I'm going to give you a definition, a working definition this morning, because for some of us, we won't uh, necessarily have an idea of, of what this is, and we need a working definition as we work through this content today. Liturgy is this. Liturgy is that which expresses the salvific relationship between God and a person. 
It's that which expresses the salvation that we have in Christ. Liturgy's primary purpose is to, listen, focus one's whole life as worship to and upon God. That's what liturgy is. For many of us, we see liturgy as song or, or uh, stanzas in a, uh, in a poem that can be given, that is given uh, acknowledgement to God. We see that in the open reading of scripture or the saying of psalms. For that, uh, maybe if you've got a Catholic background, different modes of worship that you would see or experience in those places would be considered liturgy. But for the life of a believer, liturgy is a whole life reality where our life is seen to worship and place our faith upon on God in every single moment. So now that we have this definition in place, I want to ask us this question. How do you deal with ordinary? How do you deal with the ordinary moments of life? Um, I've got to tell you, the worst place on the planet for me is the DMV. <laughs> Come on, can I get a witness in church today? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever just questioned everything about your life in the DMV? I, I, uh, I struggle with that place. And, and here's, here's the truth why. I struggle with really any place that I have to wait in line, okay, where I have to, where I have to sit like, and calm down. My, my normal nature, if you haven't even gotten it already, my normal nature is not necessarily calm. I've got, a, I've got a little bit of an energy about me every, like in, in any type of moment, I'm fidgety and my son's kind of like, I, apparently it's in our DNA because he can't, even when he's sitting here, he can't hold still, I can't hold still. Like there's a nervous energy about me that's just the way that I, I, I am, it was the way that I was designed and, and created and it works for a lot of moments. It doesn't work for the DMV and it didn't work for school. <laughs> Truth be told. And so I struggle, honestly, with the ordinary moments in life. Is anybody with me today? I like things to be fun. I like things to be spectacular. I like to have experience. I'm just, I'm just telling you how I am. I like to have experiences in everything. Like I, walk, I like to walk away from things and go, man, that was awesome. My son's the same exact way. He looks for any moment to take something to the next level. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yesterday, he, want, like, he wants to get on the mountain so bad we haven't been skiing or snowboarding yet, and so outside, he had his two sisters with a snowboard going down our front lawn. <laughs> and if it wasn't good enough for him to be doing it, when he got Eliana on the board, he hopped on the board with her, just to take it up an extra notch. Everything for him is extra. Someone shout extra. You ever met that person before? They're extra. And I've come to realize that this is, this is an issue for a lot of people. It may not play itself out the same way it does for me, but, but humanity in general struggles with, with ordinary things. See, this collection of verses that we've just read is the story after the event. It's the story after the manger, when everything had gone back to normal. Mary is caring for, uh, caring for a baby. Joseph is doing business, working with his hands, providing a living for his growing family, who in fact would themselves be dealing with economic uncertainty, political upheaval, cultural nuance, and familial baggage. Sounds like normal life, doesn't it? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with the ordinary bits of life. And I'm not talking about the days when we purposely set out to rest or live in our sweatpants. Because that's fun. I'm talking about the days when there's nothing spectacular involved. I'm talking about the car wash, getting the laundry done, I forgot the milk, did you call your mom type of day. I'm talking about the days when I read my Bible and nothing. I put the worship song on and nothing. I pray that prayer and nothing. Those types of ordinary days. I'm talking about the days that do not have conflict or confetti. I'm talking about the days that are mundane commonplace, flat, bland, and void of what I like to call personal carbonation. <laughs> Those days. On these days, pastor and writer Eugene Peterson would say Christian spirituality means living in the mature wholeness of the gospel. It means taking all the elements of your life, children, spouse, job, weather, possessions, relationships, and experiencing them as an act of faith. God wants all the material of our lives. See, the truth is, is that ordinary, most of the, like, life is ordinary most of the time. And most of the time, life is ordinary. Some of you old school, old school church people will get that little reference. 
So what we end up doing is trying to find or manufacture moments of grandeur, meaning, experience, or romance. We look for feeling, depth, passion, and sometimes even pain. It's in the pursuit of the extraordinary that we miss much of what God has for us in the ordinary, plain moments of life. Writer Michael Horton put it like this in his book, Ordinary, Sustainable Faith in a Radical, Restless World. He said this, changing the world can be a way of actually avoiding the opportunities we have every day, right where God has placed us, to glorify and enjoy him to enrich the lives of others. Sean Frank, in his book, Between Life and Life, writes this, liturgy does not mediate between the sacred and the profane, but between eternal life and daily life. The world, the flesh, and the devil work against the full realization of the promise of the liturgy and daily life. Christian liturgy is, above all, the proclamation and celebration of Christ's power to overcome them. The Christian in daily life and in liturgy represents God to the world and offers the world to God in a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. In other words, what he is saying is that the liturgy of the ordinary, your ordinary life actually brings the greatest degree of worship to God. But many of us don't think that. We think it's got to look spectacular, don't we? We want it to look grand and beautiful, but it's, come on, someone shout, normal. normal. But we don't like to be normal, right? Right? So here, here's, the, here's the question I want to ask us. What drives our disunity with the ordinary? Writer Tis Harrison Warren concludes this. She says, I need rituals that encourage me to embrace what is repetitive, ancient, and quiet. But what I crave is novelty and stimulation. Right. Think about that. What a quote. What drives our disunity with the ordinary? Well, in order to answer this question, is it right if we just do some, do some talking for a few moments? To look at this question and to answer it, we look to the great theologian A.W. Tozer for his assessment. In his writing, The Pursuit of God, The Human Thirst for the Divine, this is what he says. There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic man better than a thousand volumes of theology could do. There are verbal systems of our deep desires. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. This would be Solomon's findings. After much trial and error, listen to what he writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I want you to listen to these words. This is like just kind of like an emotive moment that, that is given to us, and he says this, I said to myself... Go ahead, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy what is good, but it turned out to be futile. I said about laughter, it is madness, and about pleasure, what does this accomplish? I explored with my mind the pull of wine on my body, my mind still guiding me with wisdom and how to grasp folly until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during these few days of their lives. I increased my achievements. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself and planted every kind of fruit tree in them. Dude made parks for himself. It's awesome. I constructed reservoirs for myself. See, many of us play golf. This guy made reservoirs. Sure. I constructed reservoirs for myself which from which to irrigate a grove of flourishing trees. I acquired male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. I also owned livestock, large herds and flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I also amassed silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered male and female singers for myself and I made concu- and many concubines the delights of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also remained in me. All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. This is an interesting piece of scripture. 
Because we look to the wisdom of Solomon many times, but Solomon's given us the heads up. He was a broken and messed up man. He goes, I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for all my struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. James, chapter four, verses one to three, he would conclude in an ever so more bluntly way, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and you do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and wage war, you do not have because you do not ask, and you, and you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Someone's like, where's the good news of Christmas? <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get there. I'm just, I'm building it up for us. I'm creating, I'm creating the tension in the room. Some of you are like, I'm about to leave the room. <laughs> this is the assessment of our humanity. Can we just stop for a second? And see? This is the assessment of our humanity. This is what scripture tells us about our, ourselves. And that's why it's important to realize that when we look within ourselves and we hear those things, it's a futile activity. It's, it's a futile thing to do because you're not going to find anything good within yourself. Only when Jesus is in us, only when the Spirit is in us, then we see something good at work. But it's the assessment of humanity. And this assessment that A.W. Tozer and James and Solomon and other, other, these other writers make is this. It is the thing that keeps us from the ordinary liturgy of life. It's our desire for things to be awesome all the time. I'm guilty of that. Trust me, you can ask my family. I want it to be up all the time. It is this within us, all that stops us from seeing the beauty of gray days, bland days, the days covered in spit up college exams and khaki colored cubicles. We pull this monster into our marriages our workplaces, our dates, our quiet times, and our churches. Here's the staggering truth we must be confronted with. I want you to hear this today, church. We struggle with Jesus when he's no longer in the manger. Ordinary Jesus. Jesus without the star, the shepherds, the wise men, the angels, the gifts, and the fanfare. Someone shout, ordinary Jesus. The Jesus that we just read about went home, got in trouble, grew up, went through puberty. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We don't think about Jesus like that, do we? We think of 12-year-old Jesus floating and 13-year-old Jesus floating and 33-year-old Jesus floating. But he went home and he was ordinary. We didn't hear about him. Ordinary Jesus, liturgy of the ordinary. Writer John Eldred says it ever so plainly and pointedly when he writes this. I want you to listen to these words. Is this all right with everybody today? Modern worship bands not only need to be extraordinarily talented musicians, young and beautiful, but their live events enjoy multimedia to keep your attention as well. Now church services compete with concert-level staging, lighting, special effects, and films. I want you to see the juxtaposition in the words that I'm saying right now. The terrible unspoken assumption creeping in is this. If you're going to find God, if you're going to have more of God, it's going to come through some amazing experience, something totally wild and over the top. Or we think that once we have God, the proof will be an over the top life. Not true, so unhelpful and immensely unkind. This expectation actually makes those deeper experiences with God seem inaccessible to most of us. Now, it's not that these things are wrong and they're in this building today. It's what we do with them, what we allow them to become in our assessment of what we think our life in Christ should be and look like. The question is this, is do we always need the lights and the stage to have a life-altering and shattering experience with God? Come on, parents, can, can, can we have spit up on our, on our shirts and still experience Jesus? Come on, can, 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 we, can we just be doing laundry and hair all over the place and stinky breath and still experience Come Jesus? Come on, somebody. Can we wake up with a little sleep in our eyes and our body's a little bit weary and pajamas that don't match and things are a little bit wrinkled and still experience Jesus? Come on, someone shout ordinary. 
It's an ordinary liturgy. Can my life still be praise unto Jesus when it doesn't look beautiful all the time and the lighting's not right and the selfie stick wasn't long enough? Come on, can we still experience Jesus? It's an ordinary liturgy. Michael Horton comments again in his book, Ordinary. Starting with the extraordinary conversion experience, our lives are motivated by a constant expectation for the next big thing. We're growing bored with the ordinary means of God's grace, attending church week in and week out. Doctrines and disciplines that have shaped faithful Christian witness in the past are often marginalized or substituted with with newer fashions and methods. The new and approved may dazzle us for the moment, but soon they have become so last year. Prayer, it's not cool anymore. Worship, it's only cool if there's stuff. Come on, I'm not talking to anybody this morning. Here's, what, here's my, my, my goal today is just to get, us, to get us into the places that as we approach Christmas is that we are not distracted by all the shiny things that we get distracted by. And I'm just doing it for me as well because it's really easy. It's really easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of it all. It's really easy to get caught up in all the things that we are doing, the running and the gunning and the death. But I'm just wondering if we realize that nine out of ten times, Jesus is just ordinary in our lives. It's just an ordinary moment. So what do we do with all this? Let's get to the good news. What is it that we're being invited into this season? The answers are found where we started in Luke chapter 2 verses 21 to 40. And so with the remainder of our time, I want to look at a few truths that Luke gives us as it pertains to learning to live out a life of ordinary liturgy. Just a few truths. Need your help today? Come on, shot number one. Is the first thing that we need to understand is that the liturgy of an ordinary life requires courage. The liturgy of an ordinary life requires courage. So let's go back, Luke chapter 2, 25 and 26. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Nelson Mandela famously once said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but the one who conquers that fear. See, so much of our lives are mitigated through the reality of fear. We fear failure, we fear rejection, we fear loss, we fear pain, we fear loneliness, we fear silence to an almost oppressive degree. Come on, how many of you get twitchy like I do when you're in the car and it's silent? Some of your personalities are perfect right there. You love it. It is heaven on earth. But for me and my family, it doesn't exist. There is somebody who gets in the car and says, can you turn it up? Can you put the music on? Can we do this? Can we do that? Because that's our, fa- we're just, whoa, 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 whoa. we are a tornado of noisy exhaustion. And the one introvert in the family is like, can you all please stop? Come on, am I talking to anybody this morning? If I were to take all the years of ministry that I've now been a part of, I would say that fear single-handedly seems to be the culprit that creates a staggering pause in one's ability to experience all that God has for him. It's not not moral issues. It's sin. And those things are a part of our life for sure. But I've actually come to find, if I were to boil it all down, the one thing that stops many of us from experiencing God is simply this, fear. Fear. It's fear, the fear that we have in us. And the reason that many of us give up on the process of God is that we refuse to live with the courage necessary to walk it out. This man, Simon, lived his life waiting and longing for the day that he would fix his eyes on the Lord's Messiah. Did did you, did you hear that? Simon is in the temple waiting. That's what his life was. Because the promise that was given to him was that you will not die until you see the Lord's Messiah, until you see the coming one. Come on, someone shout, wait. wait. That's what Simon was doing. He, he, was, he, was, he was waiting. He had the courage to, to wait. 
Many scholars and theologians believe that the potential age of this man, while unknown, could have been around 113 years old. Now, once again, we don't know his age, but if this was the case, we'd have to take a consideration of what it took for that man to wait that many years for the promise. And we struggle with 15 minutes. Come on, somebody. Some of us are hoping that when we walk out of this building today, the prayers that we prayed during worship, they're answered. And if they're not answered, Jesus, we have some issues. Come on, you ever been there before? It's like 37 seconds of prayer. God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. <laughs> Where are you at? 113 years of waiting. Come on, can I just encourage somebody today? The greatest thing necessary for walking out a journey of faith is courage. It takes courage to keep on going when we don't have the answers that we've been promised. And isn't that the one thing that we're the, we're the most fearful of? Waiting? We jump out of airplanes, move across countries and time zones, we marry and have kids, we change jobs, we try new foods, and we put ourselves in the most fearfully latent situations. We stand at the heights of cliffs just for the view, we stand in the cages of wild animals just for the experience, and we invent new ways of experiencing the thrill of pushing the limits of human endeavor. Yet in all of our musings, the idea of waiting frightens us into self-actualizing, personally controlling, destiny determined determining choice. I will never jump out of an airplane. Why? Because I'm prone to accidents. <laughs> and why jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Isn't it amazing when we assess the things that scare us? We can do all of those things, yet somebody says, wait, and you're like, what? What? I don't know if I can do that. God says, hold on. Whoa. No. God says, pause. No, I I, no, play. (laughs) Not pause, play. We don't even want play, we want fast forward. (laughs) And God forbid rewind. (laughs) I've yet to meet a greater monster in the lives of men and women than the monster of waiting. And the truth is, is that to live this life of faith, one has to come face to face with the ordinary liturgy of waiting. And to wait takes more courage than any field of battle will ever take. What do you do while you wait? I want to ask you this question. Does your waiting period look like worship? Simon waited. And not only did he wait, he waited with anticipation. Even to the point where the minute that baby came in with that family, he ran over and took the baby from the mom. (laughs) Think about that much, that that the expectancy was there, waiting, 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 waiting. It's Jesus! And he was there. You would think Simon would be at the manger, the spectacular moment. You'd think he'd be included in the story, he wasn't. He was just waiting for the promise that God said to him, hey, just so you know, you will not leave this earth until your eyes meet the Messiah. What do you do while you wait? Number two, over shout number two. Here's the second thing we need to understand is that the liturgy of an ordinary life requires that we confront our extraordinary idols. So guided by the Spirit, he enters the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, everything happens there. Verse 33, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon, I want you to get get these words, then Simon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I believe that one of the greatest idols we must confront in our lives is that, and that is rife within us and our culture is the idol of ease and painlessness. Come on, am I talking to anybody in church today? Could you imagine what those words must have meant to Mary who on that day was in the temple simply to do what was customary? 
Come on, have you ever been about your ordinary life and then all of a sudden in the middle of the ordinary moment, something struck you that changed ordinary into something that you didn't want? I didn't ask for this in this moment. I was just coming in for a normal checkup in the doctor. I, I, was, just, I was just coming in to say hi, that I, I loved you. I did not expect you were saying you were leaving. I thought, you, I thought I was just coming into your office to get a raise. I didn't know you were laying me off. Come on, I was just coming to church to be happy. I didn't know you were going to challenge my idol. <laughs> Mary was just doing what was customary I mean if it's me I want to go about my day with a bit of ease and peace and quiet I mean isn't it the hope of most of us I'd venture to guess that there are not too many in here today who woke up and said to themselves I hope today is the hardest day of my life You know, as we progress as a culture, more and more we are becoming wired to the avoidance and aversion of pain. So we seek ease. And I think this has become one of our greatest modern day idols, the idol of ease and painlessness. There's an endless degree of distractions and devices and, a, and, and additions and, and addictives one can find in the world around us to build and to, into our life for the sheer purpose of pain abatement and ease sufficiency. Yet it was Christ who would tell us that grace alone is sufficient. See, it is the ordinary life that will continually cause us to deal with the extraordinary idols in our lives. Isn't it interesting that for many of us the, the, that there is a pain associated with ordinary so we try to avoid it? We invented an entire app to make every day of our life look spectacular. Filters upon filters. Emojis upon emojis. And now because that wasn't wild enough for us, we figured out a way to put dog faces on us and sparkly eyes and stars everywhere and big noses because, well, I want extra. Now, I want to be careful to, to, to I'm not trying to demonize those things, but I am, I am trying to poke at the reality that many of us have this thing where we are, we are avoiding pain. We want ease. We want painlessness. We want to wander through the world without having to experience anything hard. And that's why ordinary is debilitating for some of us is because ordinary life, normal ordinary life is painful to us. Right. And the reason that ordinary life is painful to us is because it's in ordinary life where we have to look into ourselves. The reason that some of us struggle with silence is because in silence, that's where I walk around my head and my heart. You ever been there before? Eric and I are like, we're, we're hard up on Sabbath right now and forever forward. It is saving our lives. But can I tell you, silence in my home is the scariest thing on the planet. Because I spend those moments walking around in my head and walking around my heart. And sometimes I turn the corner of my heart and I'm like, ah, how did you get there? Sometimes I turn the corner of the hallway of my head and I realize, man, that thought, I didn't know you were lurking in there, you naughty little thought. <laughs> but in the great words of Gollum, my precious. <laughs> That's what silence says, we're scared of the ordinary. We're getting better at it. Yesterday we had worship music on and Eric and I just sat on the couch. She came, laid her head on me, and we didn't talk. Nothing. Nothing spectacular. Le le leopard PJs in an orange sweatshirt. I don't think I had brushed my teeth yet. And the kids, who knows what they were doing? We ignored them. It's Lord of the Flies somewhere. <laughs> Our neighbor's house is burnt down though, so. Um, <laughs> ordinary frightens us. But it's ordinary where we confront our extraordinary idols. The things that mean more than the ordinary peace that God gives us. For some of us, I hope this message convicts us today and challenges us. I'm just trying to be your pastor today. 
Because this is what builds our faith. This is what builds us to walk out the journey that we have in Christ Jesus. Number three, are we shot number three? The liturgy of an ordinary life requires uncompromising commitment. Luke chapter 2, 36 to 38, there was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. And she was well along in her year. She was old. <laughs> <laughs> She was seasoned, having, <laughs> having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. Listen to this next verse. This, this shook me. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. And at the very moment, she came up and began to thank God and speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. I mean, how many of you would agree with me, this, this woman earned the collateral to be able to say some things? See, if we're not careful, we miss the powerful truths that are revealed to us in the very unassuming and subtle words found in Scripture. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. Have you ever noticed that commitment has become increasingly difficult in our quick hit, fast paced, FOMO latent selfie snapshot culture? Many of us in here struggle with commitment. We wait to the last minute to say yes to something or no to something because we're waiting for a better invite. Mm. Wow. Right? We hold on to the last minute. We, pro we procrastinate with our, our commitment because something better might come along. I actually want to I wanna, I wanna challenge us today. Some of us have struggled in a commitment of yes to Jesus because we still believe that the world has something better that we're waiting for. Some of us are balancing this place where it's like, I'm still waiting for that guy or that girl to come into my life. I want, I want Jesus, but I'm wondering if I might be able to find something better than what he has for me. I wonder what this woman went through after she'd been married for seven years and a widow for 80 plus, and in her waiting and in her moments, she just simply said, I will not give up. I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. And she committed. I know we don't talk like this anymore because this doesn't give rave reviews on YouTube. <laughs> Every shot commitment? Yeah. Remember when Eric and I said, I do? Yeah. Those are big, scary words. Yeah. I do. Two words frightened me to death. <laughs> I do forever. Now, as a, as a communicator of God's word and somebody who studies a lot and reads a lot, like I've told you before, my mind is a weird world of wonder and, and crazy, okay? And so for me, I go, I go to dark places at times and I, and I think through things at, at, at big levels so I can try to get where everybody's feeling. And I've frightened myself sometimes when I considered the commitment of I do. Because it's not how it used to be in our 20s. Come on, can we talk real life in church? We don't look the way that we did then. She still does, but not this guy. Come on. Then you had kids to the picture, and church, and work, and journey. Man, how many of you agree with me? Commitment's hard. So we love the idea of being able to wander in and out of things. I just, <laughs> this lady didn't wander in and out of God's house. She waited. And not only did she wait, but she was committed to prayer and fasting. And I wonder if sometimes we look at a piece of scripture like this and we, and we, uh, we sedate it and sanitize it. And we think that the lady was just standing there. Jesus and Mary and Joseph strolling. She was like, oh, there it is. I've been waiting for that for 80 plus years. 
How nice. How good. How beautiful. Hi, Mary. May I speak to you? May I tell you the wonderful things that the Lord has done? Now, how many of you would think like I do? That place lit up. She, she got a little bit wild. And we know that because she was wild enough and audacious enough to lift her voice in a temple that, by way of culture, she was not allowed to do. She broke code. Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. When one of you talk in the bathroom, you broke code. Come on. Right? It's fine. It's fine in the women's bathroom. In the guy's bathroom, it's code. It's code. And I get it. Why? Because you're excited. <laughs> it's happening. Hey, pastor. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> Straightforward. I'm so glad you got something out of service, but be quiet. <laughs> Dee and I have known each other for a long time. We will not talk to each other at all. She broke code. She, she jumped out of no normal in that moment. <laughs> it's interesting that it took a normal moment to produce an extraordinary moment. See, we can't be afraid of our ordinary. Number four. Here's the last one. Ever shot number four? four? You get something out of this this morning? Is it all right for everybody? All right, number four. The liturgy of an ordinary life requires us to see the sacred in the simple. Yeah. Yeah. To see the sacred in the simple. Why don't you see this? Luke 2, 39 to 40. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord. Now, we could go back and we could study the scripture again next week. And we could go into all the details of the customary law that Mary and Joseph were engaging in, her ritual purification and everything that, that would take place over her for the simple fact that she was deemed unclean by way of her culture. We could go into all of those things. So there's multiple layers to this piece of scripture, but I'm trying just to see the bigger view because sometimes we just miss these things. When they had completed everything, when they got their chores done, when they got the shopping done, and when they filled up the car with gas, and when, and, and when they went and got the, the laundry done, they returned to Galilee to their own home of Nazareth. And the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. They returned to their own town of Nazareth. Many of us are afraid to go home because we are that fearful of ordinary. We're afraid to go home because I gotta have an ordinary conversation today. See, one of the greatest reasons that Jesus was rejected as the Messiah was because of the simplicity in which he arrived. And truth be told, we struggle with simplicity. Not all of us, but many of us. This is why shows and movements like minimalism, remember that second? <laughs> have been such big hits. Because somewhere in each of us, we realize that we've accumulated and amassed, and we have, in doing this, lost our souls. We've worked so hard to have all the stuff and things and we lost our soul in the, in the balance of it all. But simplicity still scares us. One more light, one more gift, one more promotion, one more rung in the ladder, one more hit of dopamine, one more vacation, one more hobby, one more, one more cookie, four more cookies. <laughs> Six more cookies. <laughs> Listen to Jesus on this matter. He says, calling the crowd along with the disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Now, what an ordinary invitation. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world 
and yet lose his life. Church, this is Jesus for normal people. Ordinary life with an extraordinary savior. He didn't come that everything would have confetti and pizzazz. He came so that you have eternal life. It's a gift we can't even realize yet or see yet, but it's in our hearts. It's beckoning to us. It's pulling us forward. And it's that one truth that allows me to be good with the ordinary moments of life. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, and the church shouted, amen, amen, amen. Come on, would you stand to your feet with me? I just want to invite you into this moment to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to ask you a question today. Before we head out back to our ordinary lives, I wonder if you have the extraordinary Savior living on the inside of you. Many of us in this room today have prayed a prayer that said yes to Jesus, and we're going to do that prayer again. And even if there's just one person in here today that would say, Jason, man, I need to say yes to this Jesus that you're talking about. We've been chasing all the extraordinary things of our life and our world, and we forgot this Savior who comes riding in on a donkey, who was born into a manger, and an ordinary Savior with an extraordinary plan and an extraordinary purpose, and that was the salvation of our souls. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray a prayer today. There's nothing fancy in these words, but rather the heart from which these words come. And I just want to encourage you today, if you're like, man, that's me, I need to say, I need to say yes to Jesus, would you make this your prayer today? Come on, as loud as we can, would you just repeat these words after me? Everybody say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my right now. And I'm putting my future in your hands. Save me. Change me. Make me new. And I declare in this moment that I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. I'm sorry for doing it my way. And today, I am choosing to follow your way. In Jesus' mighty name.